Welcome everybody to this evening's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Maya Van Rossum. I'm the Delaware Riverkeeper. And on behalf of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us to learn about the outcome of a new report the Delaware Riverkeeper Network commissioned analyzing the full greenhouse gas impacts that would result if the Gibstown Wyalusing liquefied natural gas export terminal was ever built and put into operation. During this evening's program, we're gonna begin by hearing from Tracy Carluccio. She is the deputy director with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And she's gonna provide some helpful background regarding the Gibstown Wyalusing project, the reason for the report, and let you know about the wonderful experts that really helped pull this, pull this report together for us. We're then gonna actually hear from the experts themselves. We're gonna hear first from Jackie Latinsky with Synapse Energy Economics, and she's gonna detail the analysis in the report, you know, how the analysis was undertaken, as well as the report's key findings um, and some of the stunning outcomes that, that came forth from that analysis. After that, we're gonna go right into your questions. Um, Ellen Carlson, who's also from Synapse, is gonna join us during the Q&A session so she can help contribute to answers to the great questions that we know you're gonna be asking. During the Q&A, if you can please place your questions in the Q&A function here on the Zoominar, that would be super, super helpful. I'll then be able to grab those questions and pose them to our, our presenters. Um, Annika Van Rossum, though, is also going to be helping us with Q&A in case people accidentally forget and put some questions in the chat. Annika is going to be able to grab those questions as well as pepper in some questions that we got in advance of this evening's program. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Deputy Director Tracy Carluccio. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you, Maya. So from the time we found out about the proposal to build an LNG export facility um, on the Delaware River in Gibbstown, New Jersey in 2019, we've worked to try to connect all the dots and bring together all the various parts of this project so it's full impact can be understood and accurately assessed. This picture shows that. One of the strategies used by New Fortress Energy in the development of this project was to break the pieces of the project apart, hide some aspects of it from the public and even from government agencies. This is classic segmentation and it's actually illegal under environmental laws. There are many people uh, that would be impacted by the negative impacts environmentally and also in terms of public health and safety and many species, uh, non-human as well as human, that would be impacted. But tonight, this report shines a bright light on one of the biggest impacts of the project, and that is should it come to fruition. And that would be the release of greenhouse gas emissions at every stage of the project from cradle to grave, that is from the wellhead um, in the Marcellus Shale to the burning of the fossil fuel to generate electricity at the endpoint. These greenhouse gas emissions warm the atmosphere and worsen the climate crisis that we are all facing. And it's the opposite of what we should be doing in order to tackle climate change. This is why we commissioned this report to explain and expose uh, publicly the greenhouse gas emission facts of this project. And the report's findings of the enormous climate footprint of the Gibstown Wyalusing project demonstrate how crucially important it is that this aspect is fully understood and taken into consideration in all decisions that are made regarding the project. So this project is really not just a local project. A lot of us have been fighting it here, um, you know, in the streets of Philadelphia and Camden and, and in the, uh, the fields of, of Marcellus Shale and uh, all along the transportation route. But we point out that this project has global impacts because the full life cycle impacts reach internationally. And the emissions, they contribute to heating the atmosphere globally, no matter where they originate from. Two destinations for the expanded liquefied, for the exported liquefied natural gas from the Gibbstown terminal that we know of are Puerto Rico and Ireland. These are the destinations used in the calculation of the greenhouse gas emissions that was done by Synapse Energy Economics for this report. The report is entitled Gibbstown LNG Export Terminal, 
Life Cycle Greenhouse Gas Emissions Analysis. So I want to give you just a little bit of intro to, to Synapse. So Synapse Energy Economics is a Cam Cambridge, Massachusetts-based organization. And it is a research and consulting firm. And it focuses on the intersection of energy, economics, and the environment. Since 1996, Synapse has provided rigorous technical, quantitative, and policy analysis to help public interest and government clients improve planning, policies, and decision-making in the energy sector. I want to tell you a little bit about Jack Lee Latinsky. Jackie is an associate at Synapse and was the project manager for the Gibstown Wyalusing Project Life Cycle Emissions Analysis. She led the research and the analysis of the emissions estimate for the proposed Gibstown Wyalusing Project and is the lead author of the resulting report. The, the link to the report will be put in the chat here tonight. Jackie's other work at Synapse includes analysis of issues related to wholesale energy markets, the future of natural gas, emissions modeling, and geospatial modeling. I also want to tell you a little bit about Ellen, and Ellen Carlson will be joining us for the Q&A. She's a research associate at Synapse, and on this project, she supported the research and the analysis of the expected life cycle emissions from the proposed project. Ellen's other work at Synapse includes energy efficiency analysis, gas util utility planning, and geospatial mo modeling. So you can see we have real professionals who have done a real analysis. And I'm now, without further delay, going to turn it over to Jackie Latinsky. Great. Thanks, Tracy and Maya. And thank you all for coming today. Again, welcome and thank you all for coming. Um, as Tracy mentioned today, I will be discussing our analysis of the Gibstown Wyalusing Project Lifecycle Greenhouse Gas Emissions. Uh, Delaware Riverkeeper Network hired Synapse Energy Economics, a research and consulting firm to conduct this analysis. My name is Jackie Latinsky. I'm an associate at Synapse and I led this analysis and am the lead author on the resulting report. I was aided by Ellen Carlson on the research analysis and report writing and Pat Knight served as an advisor on this project and provided quality assurance throughout. Today, I will go through what the proposed Gibstown Y Loosing project is, our methodology for this analysis, the resulting emissions, and some key recommendations that we have. You can also find here on the presentation a link to the report, fact sheet, and dashboard, and these should also be in the chat. Uh, before we get too far in, I wanted to go over a few key abbreviations that are helpful to know uh, as I go through this presentation today. Um, first, we have liquefied natural gas, or LNG. This is natural gas that has comp been compressed from a gas to a liquid state by cooling, and this is an incredibly energy-intensive process, um, and as a result, it produces a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, or GHGs. These greenhouse gas emissions include carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And greenhouse gas emissions are notable because they trap heat in the atmosphere and contribute to climate change. Different greenhouse gas emissions also have different impacts on global warming and over different timescales. So to be able to compare greenhouse gas emissions uh, across the different types of emissions, we need to normalize them. And to do this, we use a global warming potential value or a GWP. A GWP is a way to scale these different emissions into one, uh, one metric uh, called a carbon dioxide equivalent or CO2E value. Um, and these, values make it so that the different pollutants have the same impact on global warming and can be compared and, and added together. Finally, we can assess the damages of greenhouse gas emissions by using a social cost of carbon or SCC value. This social cost of carbon value monetizes the damages from greenhouse gas emissions. So the federal government, state governments, and other governmental agencies have all set emissions reductions targets and other greenhouse gas related regulations. Um, and this includes the federal government, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. The, at the federal level, in addition to emissions reduction targets, the US EPA has set limits for greenhouse gas emissions from the oil and natural gas industries. And in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, they both have goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050 of 2006 and 2005 baselines, respectively. Despite these standards, companies continue to propose and pursue new fossil fuel projects, such as natural gas power plants, 
And by doing so, they are committing to the emissions from these projects for decades to come. These projects don't only produce emissions from the direct projects, such as operating that power plant that I mentioned, but also from related industries like natural gas extraction in order to produce the fuel to operate that power plant. Accordingly, we can perform life cycle analyses to determine the full scope of impact of these different projects. Life cycle analyses capture the emissions from the start of a project, such as from natural gas or oil extraction, all the way through the different steps to the end of the fuel's life, such as at end use combustion. Life cycle analyses also always have bounds. For example, um, in thinking about this power plant, we might include emissions from pipeline leakage for transporting natural gas to that power plant, but we might not include emissions from constructing the pipelines under the assumption that those pipelines already exist and are already in the ground. For our analysis, we included emissions that would directly result from the Wyalus and Gibbstown project, but not emissions that would have recurred regardless. This means that in analyzing the Gibbstown Wyalusing project, we analyze the emissions associated with natural gas processed at the Wyalusing Pennsylvania liquefaction facility and the Gibbstown, New Jersey export facility. Um, accordingly, this includes natural gas that was extracted in the Marcellus Shale of Pennsylvania, transported via pipeline to Wyalusing, Pennsylvania, where the gas is then converted from a gaseous state into a liquid state, um, also known as liquef liquefaction or being liquefied. Um, I'll add here that this liquefaction process is highly energy intensive because, again, it involves compressing that natural gas out of the form that it wants to be in and into a liquid. The LNG would then be transferred uh, by truck or by train from Wyalusing, Pennsylvania to Gibbstown, New Jersey, where it would then be loaded onto LNG cargo ships to be transported overseas to the two proposed locations of Puerto Rico and Ireland. At that point, the gas would be regasified or converted back from a liquid into a gas and transported via pipeline to power plants where it would then be used and burned for electricity. This project is unprecedented because the liquefaction facility and export facility are located hundreds of miles apart from each other. And in comparison, most liquefaction facilities in the US and around the world are co-located so that the liquefaction facility is at the export terminal. In this analysis, we calculated emissions from 10 distinct steps in the Wyalusing Gibbstown project life cycle. I'll go through each of those steps here, and I'll give some examples about what emissions are included in each of those steps, but I'll also highlight that that is not all of the emissions that are possible and not all of the emissions we considered. I just, there are a few points where I want to be able to point out some key, key aspects and, and some things for your consideration, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's all that we considered. Um, so I definitely encourage you, if you have questions about uh, what was included, to, to please ask those during the Q&A session. So the first step um, that we have here is facility construction, and that relates to emissions that result from constructing the Wyalusing liquefaction facility and the Gibbstown export terminal. Here, um, I'll note that we included emissions from producing the concrete, as well as judging the Delaware River as two examples of where those emissions are coming from. In the second step, we estimated emissions from natural gas production. This includes the annual upfront drilling of new wells, as well as ongoing emissions from extracting natural gas from those wells throughout the year. In the third step, we calculated emissions from transporting the natural gas via pipeline from the Marcellus Shale area of Pennsylvania to the Wyalusing facility. In the fourth step, we calculated emissions from operating that liquefaction facility. And again, I'll highlight that this is an incredibly energy intensive process. In the fifth step, we captured emissions associated with loading the trains and trucks with LNG and transporting the LNG from Wyalusing to Gibbstown. In the sixth step, we measured emissions from loading that LNG onto carriers and other related operations at the export facility in Gibbstown, New Jersey. In the seventh step, we estimated emissions from transporting the LNG on those carrier ships from Gibbstown to the two proposed end use locations of Ireland and Puerto Rico. In the eighth step, we assumed a co-location of an import terminal and regasification facility 
and that that is where the gas, the natural gas would be converted back from a liquid form into a gaseous form. In the ninth step, um, similar to the third step, we have pipeline transport of that natural gas from the import terminal to an end use combustion facility. And in the fifth and final and 10th step, we calculated the emissions from burning that natural gas at an end use power plant in those two destinations. Whenever possible, we used the reported emissions from Gibstown, the Gibstown Wire Loosing Project applications and permits. And so that can include things like the company's train transport applications and air quality permits. When those specific data points were unavailable, we estimated the emissions either based on data from similar projects, such as other LNG export facilities, or on national emissions rates and other known data points about the project, such as uh, a national pipeline average leakage rate and the miles of domestic pipeline transport for this gas. And the table here provides some additional detail about he how each step was calculated. Um, and there's more detail about these in the report as well. I also wanted to give a quick overview of the dashboard that we created um, and used for this analysis. Um, this is a dashboard that is released and open to the public so that you can all uh, update this analysis as additional information about the project comes out. Um, it was really our intent to make sure folks had a way to continue to, to update this analysis because there's more information coming about about this project. It's still ongoing and we don't know what might happen tomorrow. Um, so that's possible with this tool. It's also possible to use this tool to analyze other natural gas projects um, that might have more inputs that need adjusting, um, but still have some of the, the same base underlying assumptions. On this next slide, I highlight a few, uh, a subsection of that input slide um, from the workbook. Um, this is obviously not everything that is in there, but um, I wanted to be able to show you a, a snippet of what that looked like so that if you wanna go and update the workbook, you have a, a place to start. Um, so first I'll highlight that this sheet is divided out by life cycle step. Um, and at the top here, we also have a general section for some overall inputs that users can update. Any of the cells that you see here um, and in the workbook that are blue um, can be updated by the user um, and can be adjusted based on your project's needs. Whereas cells that are not in blue should not be updated. Um, those are our set values. Um, so each input um, has a default value based on the Gibstown project. Um, so for example, you can see here highlighted in the orange box that the project is expected to export 128 billion cubic feet of natural gas per year. Um, and if a user wanted to update their own value and put in their own input, um, they could do so in this next orange box that you see where the value has been switched from default to user input. And we can update this. So instead of having the 25 year default life cycle emissions, we might just wanna look at one year of operating emissions. The last thing I'll highlight here is that we have a notes column. This provides a little bit of extra detail about what is included and meant by each of the inputs, as well as where the default value comes from. So um, on this slide, we have the 25 year operating results, as well as the two years of up construction emissions for the project broken out by life cycle step. The results are also broken out into upfront emissions, um, such as emissions from the construction of the facilities and annual well drilling, as well as ongoing emissions, which includes more of the daily operations of the facilities involved. We also present the total emissions as well as the percent of total for that life cycle step. All values here are presented in carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, um, so that they're comparable and able to be added to each other. And in the appendix of this presentation, as well as the appendix of the report, you can also find results from construction and one year of operation if you're interested in seeing that as well. Over the 25 years of operation, we found that over 80% of the emissions would result from end use combustion. And this is such a high value because it involves the actual final burning of this natural gas um, and emitting all of the resulting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. 
The next highest source of emissions in this process is the liquefaction facility operation, and this accounts for over two thirds of the non end use combustion emissions of this project. Um, as I've been mentioning throughout, this is an incredibly energy intensive process because it uh, involves compressing that natural gas out of a state that it wants to be in, and as a result, it also produces a lot of emissions. The remaining 5% of emissions come from all of the other eight steps in this life cycle process. I also want to take a step back quickly from this life cycle analysis to look at the local Pennsylvania and New Jersey specific emissions, since these are able to be directly impacted by state policies and the current state's climate targets. We compared the local results against the petroleum and natural gas system emissions of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, and this attributes those emissions to the sector that uh, they exist within, within those two states. We found that in a typical year of operation, the Gibstown Wyalusing project would emit 1.1 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. This is equivalent to 12% of the 2021 petroleum and natural gas emissions in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And these emissions would be repeated every year for the 25 years of operation, in addition to the upfront construction emissions, um, and the, so that can have a really big impact on state and national climate objectives. To go back to the full life cycle, 25 year operating emissions um, for the entire project, the project's total emissions are equivalent to 2 million gasoline cars being driven every year for those 25 years of operation. Um, and as a result, there is a social cost of carbon for these emissions um, over the project's lifetime of $53.2 billion in damages. Um, so based on this analysis, we have a few key recommendations that I want to highlight here. Um, the first is that we want to encourage policymakers to consider the entire life cycle of emissions um, for the Gibstown Wild Loosing Project, as well as other fossil fuel projects that may come up. Um, in particular, this is particularly important because greenhouse gas emissions are not confined to county, country, or state borders. And so we all need to play a part in uh, reducing those. Um, this is, again, important for ensuring that states um, and the U.S. can meet our climate targets and overall for ensuring that we can mitigate climate change on a global scale since it is a global responsibility. Next, we want to consider health impacts um, from co-pollutants related to this project um, and encourage policymakers to be aware that the emissions and safety hazards associated with this project in particular can be uncertain. Um, in particular, because this project involves transporting LNG by train and truck between two different locations, there's a lot of uncertainty um, around this because it is a relatively new and untested method of LNG transport. And this poses additional risk to local residents, um, in part because they can inhale the co-pollutants um, from these modes of transportation, as well as because there could be disastrous results if these LNG trucks and trains um, face collision. And finally, I want to encourage policymakers to consider other land use impacts of this project. Um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, we looked at the greenhouse gas emissions associated with dredging the Delaware River Keeper, but there are also other habitat impacts of that that should be considered before allowing this project to be pursued. So I've reached the end of my presentation, um, and I am interested in hearing what questions you all have. Um, and I will turn it back over now to the Delaware River Keeper Network to moderate those questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you very, very much, Jackie. That was really helpful. Um, I'm going to invite Tracy and Ellen to turn your cameras on. But with that, we're going to start with the questions. We have two questions so far in the Q&A. Um, the first one, I think, is for Jackie and Ellen. Um, at least to start, it's from Barbara Brandom. And she says, do you think that LNG terminals in other locations would have similar impacts on greenhouse gas emissions? Thanks, Barbara, great question. Um, so I think I have two parts to my answer to this. Um, first, I'll say that that is why we designed this workbook as we did, um, so that if you have an LNG facility that you're thinking of and no different inputs for that, um, you can you can update the workbook and, and find out um, and see how that might be impacted. Um, I think the other thing that I'll highlight here is, again, that this, this facility is unique because the 
liquefaction facility and export terminal are not co-located and that produces other emissions impacts that might not occur at more traditionally structured LNG terminals. Um, but that being said, there might be other increases in pipeline transport. And so it's a little hard without knowing the specifics to say definitively whether you know emissions might go up or might go down because there's there's other impacts, there's other values and, and amounts of LNG that might be exported. Um, but I would encourage you to, to use the workbook and um, see how your project that you're thinking about compares. Tracy, did you want to add a little bit more to that? Yes, I, I think that one of the um, important aspects of the way the calculations were done is that some of the inputs are somewhat standardized, like, for instance, the liquefaction at a liquefaction plant of that size would be very similar. So um, some of those inputs are going to be sort of steady state as you look across a landscape of various LNG projects. Um, but then others, of course, because of this unique nature of this project are going to vary. So I just want to point out that some of them, particularly that whopper of a number from the greenhouse gas emissions from liquefaction, um, are going to remain pretty constant, you know, multiplied by how much gas you're actually producing. Um, and so I think the next question is for you, Tracy. This is June Hammond. And she says, is the LNG destined to Puerto Rico intended to be used in Puerto Rico? Yes, as far as we know, um, there are two locations. The one in Puerto Rico is one of the locations where the uh, gas that's being produced would go. It's an import facility um, that is connected by pipeline to a power plant and it's owned by New Fortress Energy, the same company that wants to build this uh, export facility in Gibbstown. Um, so Jackie and Ellen, I think the next one is from you. It's from Ken Dolsky. And he's wondering if there's a little bit more detail on the New Jersey greenhouse gas emissions. He specifically asks, are they mainly from the transfer of LNG to the ships in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions? And what percent of the LNG is estimated to leak? Great, thanks. Good question. Um, so yes, the majority of the emissions um, that are local to New Jersey as opposed to Pennsylvania are from operating that export facility as well as some of the transport of the natural gas on trains and trucks within New Jersey. Um, so that's the first part of your question. And then I don't have a specific number off the top of my head for the percent of LNG that is, is estimated to leak, um, particularly because there's different values throughout. So one step might have a, a higher percentage than another based on how, you know, if it's gas that's in a pipeline versus LNG that's in a tanker. Um, so there may be some more information on that throughout the workbook. Um, and if you're looking for a more specific answer, I'm also happy to follow up with you after the, the webinar. Okay. Um, the next question is from Alice. And I think, Tracy, this may be for you in the first instance. What safety upgrades will be made for rail and traffic safety for communities closest to terminals, rail, and roadways? There's no special safety measures that are being put in place for the transport of LNG um, by truck. Um, they don't even need a permit. They simply have to get properly placarded and the trucks have to be registered. Um, but they don't need a special permit for that transport at all. It's carried like any other um, hazardous material would be carried in a truck, tank truck. As far as the rail is concerned, um, the special permit that was in place for this project actually used substandard rail cars that were even worse than the federal rulemaking requires. So not only was there not special safety measures put in place for those who live along the rail route, uh, those uh, from Wyalusing all the way down to Gibbstown would actually be exposed to more danger um, than um, those who would use the LNG by rail federal rulemaking to transport LNG. So I think um, bottom line, there's supposed to be some training according to uh, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration requirements of uh, first responders and fire companies. As far as we know, um, very little has been done. And we've heard, we have read reports that have been very critical of the depth, the lack of depth and the lack of equipment 
um, that's made available to those communities where that would be subjected to the transport of the LNG by rail. Great, thank you. So before we go to the next question that's just come up from Marty in the Q&A, um, Annika, I wondered if you wanted to ask one of those questions that was submitted in advance of the, of the webinar. Yeah, so one of the questions we got was, how should us members of the public consider using this report to inform or alert our elected officials or fellow members of the public? Tracy? Well, I can jump in first to say, uh, we think this report will be very powerful in terms of informing decision makers. Uh, there, are there is more and more a movement towards the consideration of greenhouse gas emissions and climate impacts of projects that go through particularly federal um, review. And the state, many states, but New Jersey um, has supposedly um, put on its docket uh, the review of climate impacts when they uh, consider permitting for a project. Um, we don't have a lot of faith in what's being done so far because a lot of projects are getting approved that have uh, enormous climate impacts. However, we believe looking at the facts and understanding how greenhouse gas emissions are emitted and the fact that just, you can very little can be done to try to reduce those um, will be um, a very important uh, piece of information for decision makers. So as far as we're concerned, um, this project it can't be improved. Um, it, it's built into it is greenhouse gas emissions that cannot measurably be reduced. So this is exactly the type of project that decision makers need to consider not approving in order to prevent the increase in greenhouse gas emissions in our states. Tracy, the next one's for you. This is um, from Marty Levine. How will the new rules adopted in New Jersey for environmental justice impact the permitting process for the Gibstown Terminal? The Gibstown Terminal has received its major permit um, and so it's grandfathered in. However, uh, when it's considered for renewal, um, it's we plan to uh, insist that the environmental justice regulations be applied. Um, also, there are permits that they will still need in order to be able to operate this project should they build it. As most people may know, the project is stalled right now. Neither the terminal dock nor the Wyalusing liquefaction plant up in Bradford County have been built. Um, this is mainly due to public opposition. Um, but because they're not built yet, they still need to have, for instance, air permits. And the air permit does re, uh, trigger the review of the environmental justice um, regulations. Uh, Paulsboro is less than three miles away. It's mapped as an environmental justice community uh, in the uh, map that New Jersey has released to um, guide communities and applicants and the DEP um, when they need to apply the EJ law. So we um, insist, and now that the rules have actually been adopted, that environmental justice uh, regulations require a thorough review of the impact on the health and welfare uh, and the public safety of those communities. I just wanted to also add that where these rail routes and truck routes are, are also gonna be impacted. Um, in terms of environmental justice, because Camden, for instance, already has trucks, it already has rail. All the South Jersey communities, including Paulsboro and Gibstown, they all have rail and trucks going through them already. And the trucks would come across from Chester on the Commodore Berry Bridge and move through that Pennsylvania community, and then would also move up into New Jersey, exposing people um, who live in already overburdened areas to additional environmental harms. Um, so Jackie and Ellen, I think the next one is for you. This is uh, from Ken Dolsky. What are the assumptions about the burning of the gas? Is this for new construction or does it replace existing sources of gas or other fuels? Thanks, good question. Um, so we assumed that the gas would be burned at a generic uh, natural gas power plant um, since we didn't have a, a specific power plant that we knew it would be going to. Um, and we assumed this would be new natural gas. So we, we, we didn't 
account for any potential decreases in emissions from other sources if it were replacing a fuel. This is just an increase um, as a result of this project. Monica, you had a, a question? Yeah, so we have a question from Jeff Rappaport that, um, which this might be for Jackie or Ellen. Are any health data costs quantified in the numbers? We did not quantify um, health impacts um, in this analysis, no. Um, those would have to be done in a separate analysis. Okay, the next question in the Q&A is from Jim Stewart. And has there been any evidence of how the LNG might be transported? For instance, purchase of flatbed tanks meeting requirements for LNG transport. I'm thinking that's for you, Tracy, but Jackie or Ellen, perhaps you have some information. Well, if Jim is asking about analysis of what types of vehicles might be used, we know that tank cars would be used should it be uh, allowed um, to travel along the rail route from Wyalusa to Gibbstown um, and using the federal rulemaking that still allows that even though the special permit has been denied. So we know it's rail tank cars. We know that there is a a uh, special, what they call a specification car um, under those regulations. And all that information is available on our, on our website um, with the information about the LNG by rail federal rule. Uh, as far as the tank trucks are concerned, there's standard tank trucks and um, they are the ones that would be used. They're called cryogenic tank trucks uh, because it needs to be refrigerated down to minus 260 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit in, uh, in order to be able to um, uh, be liquidated and liquefied and uh, transported um, in, within a, a container. So Tracy, this one's for you. Um, whether or not, presumably we at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network have any thoughts about the relocation of residents living closest to rail, highway, um, or facilities, particularly this facility or facilities of this kind, uh, is there potential for some sort of lawsuit, um, I guess, against government or industry for those who, who end up living closest if the project were constructed and going into operation? Well, I'll just say with we have um, commissioned an analysis separately that created an interactive map. And we know that two miles on either side of the rail route and of the truck route exposes more than 1.5 million people to, to be in the highest impact zone, the zone where should there be an accident and a release of LNG, you basically would not have time to get away. So that uh, high hazard zone um, pretty much defines what maybe the, the questioner is thinking of as the closest. Um, however, that's very disruptive. We're going through a city, like it goes right through the neighborhoods of um, Philadelphia, and it goes right through the neighborhoods of Camden and all the towns beginning in Wyalusing, uh, you know, Reading, near Scranton, Allentown, it goes through whole cities. So to relocate two miles on either side of the route through highly densely populated areas is going to be very difficult. Whether or not a successful lawsuit could be brought, um, we never say, you know, you can't bring a lawsuit. <laughs> I think that's, that's you know, probably the, the most reasonable thing I would say in answer to that question is don't build the project and don't transport LNG through communities. The federal guidelines for building liquefied natural gas facilities specifically say they are supposed to be built in remote areas. So all the various impacts from the building of this project and the operating of the project uh, should not be happening where they're proposing to put them. Uh, also, the regulations haven't been updated for decades. So, you know, we really at this point in time, as a, a nation and as a Delaware River watershed, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey watershed states, we're not ready for this project. And I don't see how we'd ever be. I mean, really, we want the LNG to be kept, you know, in the ground and never liquefied. So I'm going to hop around a little bit on questions, just being mindful of time because we are going to end promptly. 
Annika, can you ask the next question? Dogs are barking. Yeah, uh, let me pull up the q and So the next question is, um, are the inhabitants of Wyalusing happy with the upcoming plant, the incoming pipelines and the exiting trains, question mark, no massive protests, question mark? Well, I, I can tell you, we were just in uh, Paulsboro at a uh, evening get together, um, sharing coffee and, and Italian cookies. Uh, with people from Paulsboro, and it was standing room only. And everybody is expressing concerns about the facility, but also the transport of the hazardous materials in the train in light of the East Palestine disaster. So, um, you know, there's a lot of concern that is surfacing now as people see, wow, you know, that could happen here, and it would be even worse if it was LNG, and if it you know, 22 rail cars of liquefied natural gas equals the energy of the Hiroshima bomb. So we're talking about a huge impact should we have as many rail cars go off the tracks as they did in East Palestine uh, from LNG. So I would say that um, people are beginning to find out more about it. Uh, since 2019, we've been doing a lot of uh, outreach and and people in the communities have really risen up, um, but not whole towns. Um, some of the towns where it's located uh, actually support the project in terms of the elected officials, but the public's another thing. And the reason the project is not built yet is because people in the region are not as supportive of exposing them and their communities to these pub public health safeties uh, uh, threats and then also um, th the danger from the emissions in terms of greenhouse gases is another thing that people have expressed as a concern. So I think you you covered another question that um, was just asked, Tracy, about doing a comparison to the East Palestine derailment. So thank you. I think that question has been handled for you, Marty. If not, you can re-enter it um, lower down in the Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to go now to the question from Diana Dakey. Um, she says, thank you for this report and comments that a problem is that DEP and FERC do not acknowledge the segmented nature of projects. A project even involves multiple companies, making it hard to pin responsibility on any one player. Do you see a new approach to permitting being considered? So I'm going to, uh, I think, toss that to Tracy. I'm going to see if Jackie or Ellen, Ellen have any thoughts to add. And then I think I may have a thought to add or two, depending on what you all say. We definitely need an overhaul of the permitting for these facilities. Um, there's no experience in Pennsylvania or New Jersey for liquefied natural gas facilities. So they really need to have a whole new set of regulations before they even consider allowing any of it to, to move forward. Um, both Pennsylvania and New Jersey, um, because they don't have existing LNG facilities, are using other regulations when they do the analysis, for instance, for air, uh, for an air plan. Um, the same thing has happened for the various permits at the while at the Gibstown facility. They've used existing regulations and refused to recognize that the liquefied natural gas terminal is an energy project, which would have kicked in uh, reviews that we did not get uh, for the for the facility. We did appeal that in court, but unfortunately we lost it and the Supreme Court of New Jersey refused to hear our case. So yes, things are stacked against us in, the term, in terms of how regulations are written. Uh, we do need a change in permitting and it's one of the things that we hope to change uh, through case law and also through advocacy. Thank you, Diana. Jackie or Ellen, did you want to add anything from your experience as um, consultants in this arena? No, I think Tracy covered it well. So I just want to, um, you know, of course, acknowledge that, yes, segmentation is a big problem. Um, we've seen it in a lot of contexts, not just LNG, of course, with pipelines. A number of years ago, you might recall that the Delaware Riverkeeper Network actually brought a successful legal action in the pipeline context, challenging the segmentation of a pipeline project. And we were actually victorious. We were victorious after the project was already constructed, but this really set powerful precedent for moving forward, precedent that's been set a number of times. Um, 
we we see it, uh, concerns, but we do see concerns about segmentation continue, right? So we all have to continue to litigate over that. And it's not just FERC and it's not just the state agencies. Of course, the US Army Corps of Engineers, even the Delaware River Basin Commission are allowing segmentation to happen. So it is definitely a problem, but it is one that is being taken on through legal action, sometimes with really powerful success. And so we certainly expect to see that with regards to LNG. There are also some efforts that the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, along with our Voices Coalition that we are a part of, are trying to address legislatively. So um, keep your ears perked up for that. Some things might be coming forth soon, and we, we might need your help to really engage in support of legislation that might help address the issues of segmentation when it comes to LNG, as well as other frack gas infrastructure projects. So I just wanted to add that. Um, with that, um, we answered Marty's question. Um, let me see, sorry, I derailed myself. Um, Marty also asks, can you speak about experiences in other areas, including Southern Florida, regarding the, the transport of liquid LNG? Is there any analysis that you have done, um, Tracy, in your work on LNG, or Ellen and Jackie, that you have done in some of these other arenas that you might want to share with us? So we have not done this analysis of the Florida project. Um, New Fortress Energy owns a small project um, outside of Miami, they do not move liquefied natural gas in tank cars. They move them in uh, ISO containers, um, ISO, ISO containers, and they put them on flatbed rail trucks, uh, uh, rail beds, and move it along that way. Um, so this would be the only project, um, if, if their special permit had not been denied, uh, a couple of weeks ago, this would have been the only project in the United States that is currently operating using rail cars to transport the LNG. Um, but that has been um, allowed under the Trump administration. Uh, in 2020, there was a change to the longstanding ban that had been uh, put on transporting LNG by rail cars. And um, that uh, rulemaking through the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration removed that longstanding ban. So theoretically, um, New Fortress could move LNG by rail um, in tank cars now. As far and and that's why we're not relaxing on that. And uh, we'll talk about it at the very end here in terms of an action. But um, one of the great things about the workbook and the dashboard that Jackie discussed is that you can take a project and look at. Uh, its various components and plug the information into that dashboard in order to get um, an estimate of what the greenhouse gas emissions would be. So th that is going to be the best way for you know, regular folks to use that workbook and dashboard in order to figure out um, what the greenhouse gas emissions would be. So I think um, hearkening back to the Paulsboro vinyl chloride derailment, um, Sam notes that the bridge over the Mantua Creek, you know, there was an accident 10 years ago, I believe he's re again referring to the Paulsboro vinyl chloride um, incident. And he asks whether or not the um, bridge has been repaired and is in working order, noting that there will be more traffic. So Tracy, I think that's for you. Yes, it was a movable arm bridge. Uh, the one that was um, involved in the 2012 accident, which derailed uh, rail cars and vinyl chloride escaped um, and had uh, big impacts, very negative health impacts on the people in Paulsboro. Um, so it has been replaced with a different bridge. It doesn't operate the same way anymore. However, one thing to remember is that this is the same route that would be used by the LNG freight trains. There's one freight train route that goes along the Delaware River and terminates down at the DuPont facility in Salem County and Deepwater. And that is the route that would be used. It's the same one that went over Mantua Creek. It's the same one that goes right through the middle of all of these towns and through Camden as well. And it's the only way to get there because the Del Air Bridge is the only bridge that has um, rail cars um, with a freight um, track that comes from Pennsylvania to New Jersey down here, down this part of the state. 
Okay, so we do have more questions. Rest assured, we will be collecting them. Um, and so if people would like some follow-up information, we're gonna try to provide that um, in the follow-up materials that come. You will be getting links um, and the like in the follow-up, but of course you can download the, the, the chat, um, but there's a lot of great information in the report, in the fact sheet, um, in the workbook that we've talked about this evening. So we really wanna thank you for joining us. Um, I wanna give a shout out to a comment from June, and then I wanna turn it back to Tracy to talk about some actions you can take. But I do wonderfully have to thank June because June acknowledges that in the state of New Jersey, there is a proposal to get a New Jersey Green Amendment. And on a lot of the problems with regards to permitting and environmental justice, that might help fill the gaps and strengthen the laws so we can do better when it comes to projects like the Gibstown LNG. Um, export facility. So thank you, June, for highlighting that. Another topic for another day, but did want to recognize that. And with that, I'm going to, you know, really thank you, Jackie, so much. Thank you, Ellen, so much. Thank you, Tracy, um, for this great information. Thank you, Annika and Peter, for being key parts of the team to allow us to deliver this information. And Tracy, if you want to wrap it up with some great um, inspiring words and actions that people can take, that would be wonderful. Okay, great. Um, I want to close it up by saying that flawed accounting methods by government um, agencies and uh, also by industry, they, they only count what's released in the state when they do these state analyses or at the smokestack when they do a permitting. Um, but this is just more segmentation that we talked about earlier. And that is an artifice and it aids the fracking companies and the fossil fuel industry. It hurts people, it hurts the planet and it worsens the climate crisis. So we have to stop that kind of wrong accounting. It's one of the reasons we wanted to get this report out and get it into the hands of the public. So we're fighting to replace fossil fuels. The climate crisis is upon us. And as this slide shows, we want truly clean, renewable, sustainable, and super efficient energy sources. And we need stable economic engines supporting community health. And we need family supporting jobs that don't make you sick. And we need thriving habitats. Uh, we need longevity. Uh, and then finally, we need clean water, air, and natural assets to provide climate justice the quality of life and the energy security. We need that now and we need it for our future generations. So there's a lot of things that you can do as we, as we sign off here tonight. Um, but just the, the, our final thought is that time is, is running out for the planet and the globe's most vulnerable populations are bearing the burden of that. And they're acutely suffering the blows of climate change. This is a global environmental injustice. And it demands us to do what is right. And that is that we all, all of us, do everything we possibly can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and keep dirty fuels in the ground and out of our lungs and out of our environment. So right now we have an active petition and that petition can be accessed uh, right where you see there, sign the petition to stop LNG by rail. Stopping the movement of LNG is a strategy we're using that protects the environment and it protects public safety. It protects our vulnerable communities that can't get away should there be a, an accident. So please go and sign that um, petition. It's also in the chat, so you can copy it from there. No more greenhouse gas emissions. That's our slogan for tonight. Um, and then finally, to get involved and to get informed, please go to the Delaware Riverkeeper Network's Gibstown webpage. Uh, it has a lot of information there, but if you scroll down, you can look at the interactive map. You can look at our former webinars. You can see all the supporting materials that have helped to inform us and that we've been sharing over the last um, four years as we fought this project. So thank you all for joining here tonight. We greatly appreciate your time and thank you all of our team for putting together this presentation this evening.